Now we've talked thus far about how to name ionic compounds, which are compounds that contain ionic bonds. But how do we name molecular compounds, that is, compounds that contain all covalent bonds? Well, when we name molecular compounds, like SO2 or CH4, for example, we follow these rules. The atom on the left is given its regular name. Now, if more than one atom to the left is present, then we preface its name with the prefixes di for 2, tri for 3, tetra for 4, penta for 5, hexa for 6, and so forth. We don't use the prefix mono for the atom at the left. The atom on the right is given its regular name, except that its last few letters are replaced with the suffix "-ide". When more than one atom to the right is present, we preface its "-ide name with the prefixes mono for 1, di for 2, tri for 3, tetra for 4, penta for 5, hexa for 6, hepta for 7, and so forth and so on. This brings us to a great lecture problem that I really wish I would have included in our problem set. Oh well. <laughs> here it is. Given the name or chemical formula, whichever one isn't given here, for each of the following molecular compounds. Now I'm not going to do all of the examples shown here. I just wanted to take a look at maybe one or two. Let's look at this molecule right here, SO2. What name would I give that? Well, given the rules that we had on the previous slide, we look at the atom on the left, which is sulfur, and we note that because it's the atom on the left, even though there's only one of these atoms, we do not use the prefix mono. We do use the prefix mono for atoms on the right, where applicable. So the first part of the name is sulfur. The second part of this name is going to be this oxygen. Now, because it's the atom on the right, we end its name using the suffix ide. So this would be kind of sulfur oxide. However, we also remember that the oxygen has this subscript 2 next to it. So we have to put the prefix di before we put the oxide. So the final name for this molecule would be sulfur dioxide. Let's take a look at this example down here. We've got a chlorine that's the atom to the left, and we've got an oxygen that's the atom to the right. The chlorine's name stays exactly the same, but because it has a 2 as a subscript, we have to put the prefix di before it. Hence, the name of this is going to start by saying dichlorine. Now, what about the second half of the name? Well, the oxygen is going to be the guy on the right, so he has to end with the suffix ide. However, because he has 3 as a subscript, we have to put tri in front of his name. Hence, the final name of this compound is going to be dichlorine trioxide. I hope that makes sense. If you guys want to, you're welcome to work out the rest of these problems and see if you can do them. They will be excellent practice and good preparation for future exams on this subject. This brings us to a subject that might totally blow you away. OK, as it turns out, there are some ions that are made up of multiple atoms bonded together. These are called polyatomic ions. Now, most polyatomic ions have weird and non-systematic names, so you just have to memorize them. I want you to memorize the names and formulas of the following polyatomic ions. There's this famous cat ion called ammonium, which has the formula NH4 and a charge of plus 1. And there are these seven anions with the individual formulas and charges shown here. Now, I know this might seem cruel of me to make you memorize all these names and formulas, but I know you can do it. I did it back when I was a senior in high school. So this subject sometimes confuses students. For example, students sometimes think that they need to pick apart the nitrogen and the hydrogens in NH4+, but that's just not true. When you're making a formula using a polyatomic ion, one of these guys shown here, just treat the NH4 plus as if it were an Na plus or a K plus, for example. When you write ionic formulas, don't treat the NH4 plus as a separate N and four H's that you all have to deal with. Similarly, when you're writing a formula, just treat all the polyatomic anions, such as acetate or cyanide, for example, as if they were just a Cl minus or a Br minus. Don't let the extra atoms scare you. Going back to this, if I have a polyatomic ion, I just view the entire ion as being like an A plus X or a B minus Y. You remember us doing this before with our earlier ionic examples. We do the exact same thing, except we substitute A or B with the entire formula of whatever the polyatomic ion is. Now, to reduce confusion with polyatomic ions, we usually place parentheses around them to separate them from their subscripts Y and X. Let's take a look at this example. 
give the empirical formula of the following molecules. I have four examples you can look at. Ammonium chloride, iron 3 cyanide, magnesium sulfate, and ammonium sulfate. And I will address a couple of them right now. Let's start with the first one, ammonium chloride. To do this one, I'd like to begin by making a small table like the one shown here. I now write down the target name for which I'm trying to devise my formula. In this case, ammonium chloride. Now what is the cation's individual name? Why, it's ammonium. And what is its charge? Plus one. What is the anion's individual name? It's chloride. And what is its individual charge? It's negative one. We now return to this old format of A that has a plus X charge combining with B that has a minus Y charge. We now have to apply this to this specific example. What is my X, my A, my B, and my Y? Well, in this case, my A is NH4, my X is plus one, and my B is CL, and my minus Y is minus one. Note how I put parentheses around my NH4 here just so that I don't get the four confused or mixed up with the plus one. Now doing the same transposition of charges, turning them into subscripts like we've done in the past, I can see that my final answer is going to be NH4Cl, ammonium chloride. So let's do another one. In this particular example, the target name for which I'm trying to devise a formula is magnesium sulfate. What's the cation in this substance? Well, it's magnesium. Its charge is plus two. What's the anion? It's sulfate, which has this formula. And that anion's charge is minus two. Going through the same process as before, I basically just consider the A here to be Mg, magnesium, and the B to be SO4. My X here is plus two, and my minus y is minus two. Hence, I hope you can see that I'm treating the whole SO4 with parentheses around it as just being like the letter B. As I do the same transposition from my charges to subscripts, I can see that my final answer ends up being MgSO4, magnesium sulfate. Now I ask, can you go backward? That is, if you're given the formula, can you produce the name now I'm not going to give you the answer to this question here, but we'll instead let you attempt to do it on your own. We now arrive at our final topic for the day and for this chapter, that of naming acids. This topic is pretty straightforward. As it turns out, there are seven strong acids whose names and chemical formulas I require you to memorize. They are HCl, which is hydrochloric acid, HBr, hydrobromic acid, HI, which is hydroiodic acid, H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid, HNO3, which is nitric acid, HClO4, which is perchloric acid, and HClO3, which is chloric acid. Which brings us to some final naming problems I have for you. Give the name or chemical formula, whichever one is missing, for each of the following molecular compounds, which all happen to be acids. So that's the end of this lecture. Please tune in next time as I begin our discussion on Chapter 3's coverage of stoichiometry. I hope you've had an enjoyable time. Until then, I bid you a fond farewell.